Good morning, church. I dare say that you, as a parent, treasure the time that you witnessed your child learning to walk. And those of you who are not parents, yet, have probably been thrilled as you watched a child learn to walk. I remember well the thrill of anticipation to watch those first steps, encouraging those first steps, all the while attempting to get a good picture. Now, for those of you under 40, understanding the words attempting to get a good picture is foreign, and I get that. But for those of us who remember the days when a good camera was not in my back pocket, attempting to get a picture of any sort was a real challenge. Despite the fact that I have three children, it never lost its thrill as each ventured out to take those all-important first steps. One started walking right on time and then got so sick she couldn't even hold up her head. So I got to watch the first steps twice with that one. Good for me. The next child was quite content to watch the world go by. However, finally, after much encouragement, she took her first steps, even though she was a little bit later. And by the time the third one was long, came along, oh, he couldn't wait to get up and keep up with everyone, so we almost missed his first steps totally. We have been looking at the book of Ephesians for a few weeks now, and good news, next quarter's Sabbath school lesson is all about Ephesians, so you get to study it in more depth. It is probably Paul's, of all Paul's epistles, it's probably the one that is most contemporary, focusing on encouraging those first steps as a Christian. He recognizes that most of his converts, who were Gentiles, needed encouragement to learn how to walk in a way that would protect them from the Hellenistic environment in which they had grown up of mystic religions, the magic, the astrology associated with it, so they needed a theoretical basis in the gospel. And Paul thus writes giving directions to them. Now, our church is about ready to start in on the same adventure. If you were here last week, you know we had a very high Sabbath. As Mary Ann alluded to in our, in our prayer, we had eight baptisms of children, and we had several, like three or four, give their heart to Jesus. Now is the time that we're going to learn how to walk in that new Christian life. So before we get into Ephesians any further, let's take just a second to pray for a second. Father in heaven, you know the situation here in our church. You know that we are ready to walk into a new life of Christianity with you. And in a special way, we're asking that your Holy Spirit be here among us to guide and teach us so we can understand those things that are most important for us to know about you and your plan in our Christian life. Amen. The basic theme of the book of Ephesians is the need for unity within the body of Christ. It seems the underlying force that pushed Paul was his excitement to watch his children, those who he had labored to birth into a life of Christ, in Christ, learn to walk and live in a oneness with God. So he emphasized the importance of togetherness in the church family. I'm sure you've heard the famous old story of the minister who, when he first came to a church, um, was getting to know all of his members and realized there were quite a few that never bothered to attend thought it important that he go visit them. And on one of those visits, he was greeted at the door by um, a member who in no uncertain terms said, I'm not attending that church. I don't need to be there. Oh, I still believe in God. I'll still study my Bible and pray, but I just don't need to associate with them. I'm just fine right here in my comfy little place. So the wise old preacher thought, okay, 
So he just sat there and talked with him for a few minutes about his crops, the weather, and such topics. Then as he got up to leave, he went over to the fireplace and took out a coal from the center of the fire and laid it on the hearth. As the two of them stood there and watched the coal slowly die out to ashes, the missing member looked at the preacher and nodded. He was in church attendance from that day on. Even with all our faults and doubts, we are better together than we are without. Today, as we look at Ephesians 5, we see Paul having just given practical warnings on how to live the Christian life with one another, no matter the backgrounds, now transitions into an active participation of the triune God in equipping believers with gifts provided as the way to live their lives, as a new person they had become. Have you taken time recently to contemplate your gift? And are you using them as God intended? You know you got at least one or two, probably five. But the problem is, if they're not used, they wither and die away. So our church has made a way to prevent that. We got VBS coming up soon, and we can use your gift. As a matter of fact, in my room, I need somebody who has the gift of being able to get into a squatting position in less than two minutes. <laughs> yeah, forget it for me too. But there's somebody out there who can do that, and I need you. Let me know. Um, you can join us because we need your gift added to those that have already been committed. All right, commercial over. Paul's continuing with more specific directions on how to walk the Christian lifestyle. Perhaps your translation, and I hope you're following along in Ephesians 5, um, uses the word live or living where other translations use the word walk. So as we're going through this, remember that the words are sort of interchangeable. If we say walk, it's the same as live or living. Um, the directions given are presented in three specific um, concepts of how to walk. First is walk in love, walk in light, and walk in wisdom. First step, walking in love. Have you tried that? Have you tried that and suddenly found yourself snarling about some hurtful thing that was done to you or someone you love? Leading you to a place that's not very loving. I relate well to hating someone who caused harm or embarrassment or something to me or even somebody that I loved a family member, perhaps, with no excuses, how do I get and struggle past that hating of these difficult people? God's first solution to that dilemma is found in the first few verses of Ephesians 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Paul, having established the, efficient, the Ephesian Gentiles as part of the Christian community, now calls them to a practical action, moving beyond just their life with God to an outward focus. As we concentrate on those words, imitators of God, we recognize there's no possibility that I can pattern myself after him in most of his essential attributes. Perhaps that's why it's only here in Ephesians 5.1 that this bold word is applied to the Christian relation to God. However, the concept imitate God is the whole basis and teaching of the New Testament. But it is only in the moral realm that we can imitate God. Living his love is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. I find it inspiring that Christ so often taught that to agape, 
we must be born again. Not a change, but a total dying of self and a rebirth. As a matter of fact, according to John 3, 3, Jesus said, except a man be born again from above, unless he receives that new heart, that new desires, the new purposes and motives leading to a new life, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then, as a baby learns to walk, we too need to learn how to live the Christ-centered life. This me needs to die so that the new me, born from above, can exist. I believe that's why the Bible so often refers to crucify as the way to die to self. There are lots of forms of dying to self that one can inflict on themselves. However, crucify is not one of them. If you're crucified, it has to be done from someone other than yourself. I cannot die to self and I cannot live again unless God does it for me. I consent, he does. Paul admits, I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So the I of self is no more. The I of God now is. I heard a story recently about a man who was cleaning his man cave. He noticed there were cobwebs in the corner. So he got out the long-handled duster and he swept them out of there. Yep, we really need to clean out the cobwebs of sin and greed and selfishness. However, as it happens, next week as he was cleaning, guess what? They're back. The cobwebs are back in the corner. And again, he had to clean them out. Week after week, the cleaning continued. Every week, he had to clean out those cobwebs. As he was complaining about those awful cobwebs, his wife reminded him, cobwebs aren't the problem. Kill the spider, and the cobwebs are gone. Once the spider is gone, the starting point to this new life in Christ is possible. It's possible to walk in love. As children learn proper behavior from the parents, so the new Christian should watch God and do what he does. Mostly what God does is love you. As we observe how God loves, not cautiously, but extravagantly, he did not love to get something from us, but he gives everything to us. That is the way we are to love. By the way, that's the Message Bible's paraphrasing of the verses that we have just been studying. All of heaven has been enlisted in your salvation. And when this reality finally smacks you, how to walk in love becomes doable. Love to Jesus is demonstrated with a desire to work as he worked for the blessing and uplifting of his church community specifically and others generally. I love you for by embracing our differences, the community of God doesn't just grow, it thrives, and the spider is dead. The instruction to love as Christ is that he loved us and gave himself up for us. Atonement is available to me, to you, because Christ a member of the triune God, gave himself to humanity, not as a passive participant. He was and is the initiator of that act of love, that love that recreates me back to the image of God that I was originally meant to be. What did he give, you ask? He gave his place in heaven and became forever linked to be one of us. His love is specific. He gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice. To understand that fully, we go back to the Old Testament um, system, sacrifice and sanctuary system, where the lamb was the substitute for the sinner. Christ became the curse due to the lawbreaker, that the lawbreaker 
had the opportunity to become the righteousness of God. And then the reference that is made there that Christ's offering was a fragrant um, offering testifies that it was wholly acceptable to God and the law's demands are met. So um, our love then flows out from and corresponds to our acceptance that he laid down his life for us. We are to love others to the point of sacrifice. Are you willing to make that statement personal? The fact that he became human is evidence enough of the great love that he has for us. But then to go the step further and lay down that life in my place, that's beyond my comprehension. All I can do other than walk in love is as learned by his life. It is the foundation of how I live through the transforming and empowering of the Holy Spirit. You know, it was only when I started asking specifically that the Holy Spirit live in me every day that one day I realized the hating had left me. And even though the pain of what happened is there, I may be annoyed with the injustice. The individual hating is gone. Praise God. I hope you noticed in this last paragraph that we talked about the triune God. You see, the being or part of God that we call Son did the love demonstration on the cross. The being or part of the triune God that we refer to as the Father was there, demonstrated by the fact that there had to be darkness around the cross to hide his presence. He was there ratifying and confirming that justice has been met. And the being of God that we call Holy Spirit applies that love, transforming us to the image that we were created to be. Moving along into verse 3, Paul continues his instruction on how to live in the Christian community. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place with God's people. The very fact that Paul focuses on these particular sins here and in several of his other epistles is evidence of the prominence it held in the world at that time. That's so unlike our world today. Not. <laughs> Paul warns the church community concerning these evils that are brought about by the attitudes that and actions that so dominated their society and could easily creep into the church body as acceptable ways to live. He's not just saying to avoid these things. It's more like he's saying, you're a saint, now live like one. He specifically addresses immorality, which is the once commanded with no thought about another person, and impurity, addressing it immediately after he has so eloquently described how a Christian should love as Christ loves. Now he recognizes Satan has an alternate plan that he is trying to inflict on God's church to love as a perversion of God's authentic plan. But the point of this verse in Ephesians 5, I believe, is the word greed associated with this list of sins, suggesting that the reason behind the immorality and impurity is greed. It was the root of the sin, more so than the physical act done, that Paul wants to emphasize. You see, those sins mentioned only affect me and, and maybe someone else. So it's no big deal, right? Not so, not according to Paul. He has this greed thing because it's the base um, of nearly every sin. Then he points out that greed has no part of the Christian's life that walks in love as demonstrated by Christ. Verse 4 takes aim at this in even a deeper level. Obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes, these are not for you. 
Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. Apparently, the society of the time cheapened God's gift of intimacy by making it the topic of jokes and crude language. Oh, again, I'm so glad this is not a part of our current society. Hmm. Has there been a return to the same culture that embraces the funniness of immorality? One of my favorite Bible scholars and authors, George R. Knight, puts it this way. It is one of the tragedies of Christianity that many church members are among those who get drawn into the visual and verbal sewage of the media. Strong language, but it seems that our era perhaps needs this counsel from Ephesians, perhaps more so than the Ephesians of the first century. The good part, though, is that Paul provides an antidote to this by saying, let there be thankfulness to God. My personal experience shows me that when I consciously put forth an effort to be thankful and spend time in praising God, my whole attitude changes. Greediness flees. Recently, I prayed about my grandsons. Now, my grandsons are older, and it's rare for them to talk to granny. They're kind, they're, they're respectful of me, they're, you know, when I talk to them, yeah, it's wonderful, but they just don't remember to talk to grandma as much as grandma thinks they should. So I prayed that God would take care of them, would nudge them back into a loving relationship with him. And do you know, within 12 hours, I heard from both of them, from each one of them. But, I pr- and I praise God and an- for that answer to prayer. However, it would have been more better and less stressful on me if I had originally prayed, God, I know you love my grandsons. And I know you're working in their lives. Thank you for your love and your nudging of them back to you. I would really love to hear from them, though. Do you think you could work that out for me? Um, Now you try it. See how spending intentional time praising God for his many blessings. And don't be general. Be specific. Changes your whole being. And then let me know what you find out. Paul understood this tendency of uh, people toward impurity and now sets forth some incentives for Christians in verses 5 to 7. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy, greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in things these people do. This is pretty strong language used by Paul as he presents the first incentive to rid one's life of these sins as the certainty of judgment. He is specifically speaking to those who cherish immorality as um, a way of life. God, or Jesus often spoke of the certainty of judgment, yet in spite of the negative aspect that we tend to pay attention to when we talk about judgment, judgment's purpose is, and always has been, to reveal how good God is with the goal of encouraging as many people into a loving relationship with him. It's meant to vindicate God and his followers and to encourage as many as he can to repentance. Because of his love, God will not let the destructive principles of sin continue forever. He must put an end to that sin. Clinging to the sin will only lead to destruction. Clinging to Christ leads to life with him. With verse 8, Paul moves on to a new thought. For once, 
You were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of the light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Paul asserts that Christians have light. Not that they used to live in darkness, even though that's true. The focus is that the Christian life is not an improvement on what life used to be, but it's a new one altogether. That old one has been crucified, and the new one is now living in light. It's a life motivated by the love of God, giving to others rather than greedily talk, taking from them in any way that paves the way to walk in light. Paul says that the results will be that the Christians desire to walk in God's ways and seek to discover what is well-pleasing to the Lord, as you notice in verse 10, and will avoid participating in the unfruitful works of darkness, as he outlines in verse 11. The fact that Christians are living in light reveals dark works for what they really are. Then as Paul describes in verses 12 and 13, light discovers what those acts really imply. Why? To expose the acts of those who currently live in darkness with the hope of bringing them to a point of desiring to walk in light. The Christian life makes the difference. It's that very life that demonstrates God's principle of love. Then, as metaphorically described in verse 14, the new life is nothing less than awakening out of sleep, rising from death, and being brought out of darkness into light provided by Christ. You see, it's my willingness to die by means other than I conflict to myself that a new life is to begin as God's workmanship product. It's all too easy for believers to be influenced by the surrounding world and succumb to its ways of thinking and behaving, resulting in what is acceptable hate behavior for the culture of the day to be accepted in the church community. Walking in light, therefore, lets the Holy Spirit open my eyes that I can see the alienation that sin actually brings. As we see the wickedness of sin in opposition to the beauty of the character of Christ, evidence is given that I am walking in light and Satan's delusions about walking are seen for what they really are. Then I can make an intelligent decision on how I want to walk, which leads Paul to talk about the next walk experience with instructions in walking in wisdom, which is really a continuation of walking in light. Verse 15, he starts out with, watch carefully, therefore, as to how you walk, not as unwise, but wise. In general, I dare say you are very careful about those things that are important to you. How much do you care about your Christian life? Enough to give it contemplation? Enough to desire to be born again Christian? Enough to desire to do God's will? Paul tucks into this, pregnant, to this passage that pregnant little word translated as wise. He's assuming that the born again Christian is already wise and understands God's ways, things that were lacking before conversion. So his approach to this statement isn't that they're not wise, but that there's the possibility that they will not use their already acquired wisdom in making intelligent decisions. <sighs> this kind of screams at me. How many times do I, even now as a Christian, make decisions from a place that is not very wise. You know, one of the best things I ever did was some months ago, I read a book over and over and over again about how to live in the Spirit and abiding in the Spirit. My focus before that had always been on living just as God wanted me to. And I was getting nowhere. 
I still gave all those crazy drivers a piece of my not-so-kind mind. I still hated that person who took my parking spot. And I still wanted all my stuff tucked in close to me. After reading those books and realizing that it was not me, but Christ through the very real Holy Spirit living in me that would rebirth me, I now can honestly say that I still talk to those crazy drivers. God didn't make them disappear. But now, when I question their odd moves, it's not from a place of malice. And as to where I park, God always provides me a place. No worries. Wow. A Christian wiseness comes from being filled with the Holy Spirit. I promise you it will make a huge difference in your life, too. Wisdom is a gift of God available to you and to me. Paul continues his concern that his children, those of his flock, demonstrate how walking in wisdom is done by the use of their time. In verse 16, he says, making the most of the time because the days are evil and discerning God's will. In verse 17, do not be foolish, therefore, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Making the most of time because the days are evil was a verse that I attempted to kind of run through and not give it the relevance it deserves. Time is an opportunity to bring glory to Jesus. A universal talent that all of you possess. To Paul, as he is writing to these churches he has nurtured for so long, his concern is that there is precious little time remaining as signs were not lacking to the impending fall of the Jew Jewish commonwealth and the impact that that would probably have on the Christian cause. Do we need any more signs to recognize the same issue in the 21st century? The signs are evident that the world is falling apart and man has got no cure for the impending fall. Time to bring God glory because the days are evil apply now even more so than they did to the first century Christians at Ephesus. And as to understanding the will of God, it's apparent that the general will of God is that we become more like him. Easy. But taking this wise counsel a step further to what is God's particular will indicates that he has a specific intent for you personally. It is only through careful thought, searching of the scriptures, and prayer that that plan comes to you. It's through a personal interaction with the Holy Spirit that it becomes real. Again, when I realize that the Holy Spirit is not an it, but a very real he, and allowed him to daily fill my life, then I could truly see and be the new person so that his, be, his purposes are more clear to my wise thoughts. In verse 18, Paul transitions to two commands that continue to be closely related to understanding God's will. The negative side warns, do not become drunk with wine, which only leads to a hangover. And on the positive side, is counsel to be filled with the Holy Spirit. To understand these, it's important that you understand that the culture of Ephesus at that time was, the central to it was the worship of Dionysus. And that included wine and drunkenness. For the frenzied and ecstatic rituals of this worship, intoxication was required and was believed to be synonymous to being filled with the spirit of Dionysus. Thus, Paul has a very real concern that these new Christians understand that wine and drunkenness are not to be a part of the Christian thinking, and that this trend was dangerous, 
that believing the same condition would increase their own Christianity was not its purpose, and it would only lead them to a hangover. It's a waste of resources that could have been used to further glorify God. The church's ability to walk in wisdom would be seriously damaged if this practice continued to be a part of who they were as a Christian. It's great that Paul has a better answer. If you want to walk in wisdom, he says, turn away from the drunkenness and be filled with his spirit. That word filled, again, is very pregnant with meaning. You see, filled is an imperative. In other words, it's not optional to Christian living. Filled is an impassive voice. The spirit actually takes the initiative to, as we open our hearts to him. Filled is in the second person plural. It is a command to the Christian community. Filled is in the present tense. Filled with the Spirit is a continued need. It's not a once-for-all experience. This verse brings the way to walk in love, walk in light, and walk in wisdom to the height of personal contemplation for the Christian. To do any walking, it seems that filling with the Holy Spirit is paramount. So that the rest of our focus for today's study, verses 19 through 21, will bring out four positive results that flow from that imperative command to be filled. The first two are found in verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Taken together, these phrases imply the worshipful fellowship of the Christian community and bring out Jesus is our living hope. Thank you, team. What a great song. Worship is not just a private affair between me and God or or you and God. Now I'm going to date myself, but that's okay. You all know I'm an old lady anyway. Um... Solitary living creates grumpy old men or women. In that movie, the grumpiness occurs as they look out on the world from their solitary lives. When they actually start to mingle, despite the growing pains of doing just that, the grumpiness lessens, and they actually learn to live in harmony. God created his people to be in fellowship with each other. I know personally that the best moments of my life and the times I am happiness, happiest are when I'm with one or more of my um, church friends. Think about it a minute. When you laugh, do you laugh alone? You might have a chuckle if you hear something funny or read some funny article. But if you want to really have a good guffaw and really a good belly thrusting laugh, it requires more than one. You all know I'm part of a couple of groups, and I believe every single one in those groups will admit that we have great times of fellowship and worship, and that includes laughing together. Do you need a good laugh? Come join us. The third attitude that flows out from this spirit-filled Christian community is giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. A complaining Christian is a contradiction of terms. During Jesus' time on earth, he constantly was faced with murmuring religious people. They complained about who he brought to church, what he ate, who he ate with, what he said, and how he said it. Not much has changed. Modern-day Pharisees complain about similar situations. We don't want to be a Pharisee, you see. No way. Um, When my focus is on complaining rather than offering thanksgiving for the blessings that God has been pleased to give me, I even notice a down-in-the-mouth attitude to the point of depression. I have more times than I want to admit 
had a little voice speak to me that says, you know, if you take time to praise God, things don't look so bad. Thankfulness turns my whole life around. And bouts of depression flee. Gratitude is a gift provided by the Holy Spirit that literally produces joy. Hope you notice that Paul, to Paul, thankfulness was doubly important because he previously mentioned thankfulness and as an antidote to a wayward thinking of walking in love. And again here, as it inspires walking in wisdom. The first attitude, or the fourth attitude, I'm sorry, that flows from the spirit-filled life is being submissive to one another in the fear of Christ. That's probably the toughest one of all. The one that most of us fight against more than others. Submissive? You mean that I must be more important? That you must be more important than me? No way! Well, that's a bit dramatic, and it's really not the point. However, being submissive to one another means that Christians defer to one another rather than self. There's no way that self and the spirit can fill the same space at the same time. Remember, this caution from Paul includes the words, in the fear of Christ. Out of respect for who Christ is and what he has done to birth his church, I am submissive, respectful to the rest of the community of Christ. They are my family. So despite um, my thoughts of submissive being <clears throat> attitude, I have to remember that a Christian thinks of others. A Christian is not individualistic. A Christian has a team attitude. And a Christian is happy when someone else succeeds. We have a whatever brings Christ's glory is a good thing concept. When Christ died and spilled his blood and water from his side, he birthed the new church, adopting its members as joint heirs with him. That means that his desi he desires that they come to unity as he, his father, and his spirit are. That, my friend, is what submissive is about. Come unity. You is a part of God's heart as much as I is. Which now brings us back to the walk in wisdom. The wisest thing for a Christian walk is unity with his brothers and sisters. Not a losing of who I is, but a union of who I is with a union with who you is. That's what creates a church that can grow and touch the world. Together, we can go into the world making disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things that Jesus has commanded. And lo, he is with us always, even to the end of the age. Did you catch the key in that? He is with us always. All of this walking that we're instructed to do happens because he is with us. He has sent his spirit for that very purpose so that we can learn to walk. Walk in love, walk in light, walk in wisdom. Okay, so I hear you say, well, how? How do I learn to walk? You know, it wasn't very long ago that I watched as Lionel, Luca, and even Amelia, who I don't even see here today, I watched them take their first steps. After a few steps, plop, down they go. And up they get almost as quickly as down they went. Then a few more steps, and guess what? Down they go again. This time, looking to mom and dad, saying, did you see that? I walked. Not I plopped down, but I walked. And here I go again, catch me if you can. It's time for us old folks to focus on the walking, not the plopping. Probably the best counsel 
I ever heard on how to walk is found in the steps of Christ. You have given yourself to God to be wholly his. You cannot atone for your sins, but believe Christ did this for you. By faith, you became Christ's child, and by faith, you grow, walk in him. Get it? By giving myself to him and taking what he gives, I can walk in love, light, and wisdom. Unless I take what he gives, himself and his spirit, I cannot, I cannot explain it to you. You must experience it. My life is a daily surrender to be filled with his spirit. And somehow or the other, despite my plop downs and my walking in a wrong path, he's there to nudge me back on track. So I say to you, start walking the experienced path with his spirit, and he will give you the experience of love, light, and wisdom. Then I ask that you come and explain it to me, if you can.